Welcome to The Lawyerist Podcast, a series of discussions with entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. Lawyerist supports attorneys building client-centered and future-oriented law firms through community, content, and coaching, both online and through The Lawyerist Lab. And now, here are the co-authors of The Small Firm Roadmap and your podcast hosts. Hi, I'm Stephanie Everett. And I'm Zach Glazer. And this is episode 350 of The Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. In today's episode, Stephanie is talking with Susan Leoto about ethics in our world today and how we can use ethics to make better decisions. Today's podcast is brought to you by Lawmatics, Latera, Rankings.io, and Text Expander. We wouldn't be able to do our show without their support, so stay tuned because we're going to tell you more about them later on. So, Zach, one of the things that you were noting is that we read a lot of books at Team Lawyerist. <laughs> Yeah. It, and it's not just like, oh, we read a lot of books. So because we do have a lot of readers here, but, you know, we we kind of I, I've been sent, I think, five or six books in the the slightly over a year that I've been here that were directly from lawyers that I've read. They've been fantastic books and they've all been related to what I do. Yeah, I think, you know, we talk about our values a lot. And one of our values is grow as people. And we're constantly challenging ourselves to how can we be lifelong learners and and create an atmosphere of learning where our team members want to read books and want to or or listen to podcasts or read blogs about their area of the business so like in your case tech and the tech world but also then larger business principles Right. And I, I bring up the the books because it's something kind of physical that I can say, like, because I was just looking in my office the other day and I was like, oh, man, there's a stack of lawyers books. Um, but it is it's it's what blogs or magazines or, you know, all those things that we we go out, and we read and we we connect with. But then I think we have a, a culture of also sharing those things and saying, hey, I, I read this really good book. I think it'll work well for you, Stephanie. And here's a blog article that, that was fantastic. And, and it, it makes sense for me, but I think it'll also make sense for HR. So, so Paige, you know, he, here's a, here's a great article for that. And I, I really like that culture of sharing this experience of being lifelong learners as well. Yeah. We've talked about like in the past, we've, we've done book clubs. So, I mean, we're doing mm -hmm. one now, Aaron read a book that he thought would help people on our team. And it was kind of about personal finances and how you think about personal finances. And, and I'm hoping that we'll have the author on the podcast soon. So I'm not going to spoil it. But we sent a copy to everyone on our team. And then we plan on having a discussion about it because and that's what's coming up already. People have already started talking about it. But it's just kind of fun to be able to read something and then share it with the team, like you're saying, and, and have those conversations. And I think that's one of the things specific is that they, this book, um, I'm, I'm part of the people that are reading this, this book isn't about my role at Lawyerist. It's about my personal kind of financial health. It's about my personal well-being. And I think that's special about here as well. Um, and I think that's, I'm sure that's special about other organizations that are out there as well. But I think that's special where it's not just, hey, Zach, here's a Here's a legal tech book that we think that you'll you'll nerd out on. Um, here's something that's that's beneficial for you too. Yeah, and it, it had me thinking. You know, we talk a lot about team wellness and things we can do to to take care of our team. And I think what we're talking about today is just another element. So, how are you taking care of your team's professional development and personal development? You know, we mm -hmm. often think in terms of CLEs or how we're staying on top of our area of law, but how are you helping your team think about other things may be related to the business or even personally. And so one of the things I've thrown out to our team is, you know, I'll bring in a financial coach to do personal finance. I don't want to know my team's finances. Obviously, I know how much right. everyone makes, but I'm not trying to get into everyone's personal mm -hmm. business. But can I be a resource for our team by providing a financial coach who can come in and help make sure each team member has a personal financial plan? That's what we can do to help make sure our team is growing as people and, and set up to succeed. Well, I, I love that one because it's, 
you know, a lot of organizations say, okay, well, we're going to set up a, a way to contribute to your retirement plan. And that's one step towards making sure that your employees and, and the people that you work with every day also have a healthy financial plan. But, you know, taking that next step and saying, okay, well, as a group, we can bring in somebody that can really educate all of us on this. And we, we want to make sure everybody has, you know, healthy life outside of, of what we do. And I, I think that's a specific example that's fantastic. Yeah, perfect. So if you're listening to this today, you know, I challenge you, what books are you reading, but also what books could you share with your team or resources that you could share with them that might help them think about their job differently or, or maybe just their life differently because that's fun too. Hey y'all, it's Zach, the legal tech advisor here at Lawyerist. Today I'm joined by Matt Spiegel from Lawmatics. For those of you who don't know, Lawmatics is a powerful CRM built specifically for attorneys. Hey Matt, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, good to, good to talk to you again, Zach. So Matt, I, I think one of the things we wanted to talk about today was client communication. I know that's a big subject, but it's definitely something that you're interested in and Lawmatics you know, handles. Yeah, it definitely is something that Lawmatics handles, but I think more importantly, is just one of those topics that it seems like table stakes, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like, yeah, of course, like, of course I got to communicate with my clients. Like that's just how a law firm works. Like how else would it work? Right. But the reality of it is that like, it's a lot more than that, right? It's not a lot more than just like, yeah, sure. Like I call my client and let him know when there's an update or, mm -hmm. you know, answer his questions or, or her questions, but like, it's a lot more than that. And I'll, I'll share a story in a moment, but you know, from my own background and kind of how I got started, but that failure to communicate properly is still, I believe, the leading complaint to state bars across the country. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when we think of communicating with our clients, a lot of times as lawyers, we think, like you were saying, update them on the status of the case, you know, tell them, okay, hey, we filed the case here, or just making sure that they generally know what's going on. Most of the time, I think a lot of us think, okay, well, I know what's going on. They trust me. They're not going to need to know any more than that. Yep. Yeah, you're 100% right. And the problem is, is that's not the way that it is, right? Right. And so I'll share a story. I mean, this is, it's just highly relevant to this topic and it's definitely a knock on me, but this was long ago, back when I was still practicing law. Yeah. When I started my own law firm back in 2000, the end of 2009, mm -hmm. I brought several clients with me from my old law firm that I was at. And within, I, I want to say it was like within two weeks of starting my own firm, I get a letter and it was a, a state bar complaint oh, man. issued on me by a client that I had brought over. And it was not that I failed to handle his case properly or that I didn't practice law as well as he thought that I should have, or right. that I was negligent in something, or I forgot a court date. And it was nothing like that. It was simply that I didn't call him enough. That was basically it. Um, he was complaining that I would try to get a hold of you and you were busy in court and then you didn't call me back quick enough. Mm -hmm. And so I took that, obviously, obviously I was devastated by that. And, and even at that time of my career, I really, really prided myself on customer service. And I thought about my business in terms of customer service, but I, I took that to heart and I thought to myself that there must be a better way. Like, I was in a position as a criminal defense lawyer where I couldn't answer the phone all day. And a lot of lawyers are in right. that same position, right? You, you know, you might think like, oh yeah, cool. I sent, I sent my client an email, let them know what's going on. But like, you're busy, mm -hmm. right? You can't pay hundred percent attention to hundred percent of your clients all day, every day. Right. And as criminal defense, like I'm in court all day. So it's literally impossible. Right. Right. And I mean, like I could, and then I would get held in contempt by the judge who was pissed off at me using my phone in the courtroom, right? While you're texting with your client and the, you know, in the, yeah. Exactly. And so, so I thought to myself, there has to be a better way to engage and to provide this person. Because what, what ends up happening, what's really interesting is you may think that the client, you know, needs more from you, like needs to call you too much and, you know, or more than you think is necessary. But all they're usually 90% of the time, all they're calling for is they want to kind of know what's going on in my case? And like, do I need to do anything, right? And what you have to right. remember about that client is for them, this is the most important thing happening in their life. Almost, right. no matter what type of law, almost every type of law, if it's personal injury, if it's family law, if it's criminal defense, if it's 
you know, immigration, right? Like bankruptcy. Right. These are things where that person, it's probably the most important thing going on in their life. And it keeps them up at night. It they absolutely it keeps at them up at night. in the morning. Yeah. yeah. And so you as their lawyer, you need to understand that. Like to you, it's a client. And yes, you're representing them zealously, but to them, it's everything. Right. And so they're going to call. They want to know what's going on. And I thought to myself, there has to be a better way. And that's actually, truth be told, how my first company, my case, got started was simply based on this premise of, I have this client who complained about me because I didn't communicate with him enough. And I understand his complaints, but I want to be able to provide him a way to get his communication without him really needing to, to call me all the time. Let's just feed him that information, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was like the start of, you know, a client portal, which ended up becoming the My Case Practice Management System. You know, and we've obviously really, really thought about that and taken it to another level with what we do at Lawmatics. But the idea is that like, you can never over communicate with a client. You just can't do it. And what you have to remember is your clients, they, they have a lot of different methods and mediums to communicate on right now, right? Yeah, yeah. And you need to kind of, I think, tickle all different, you know, each each of those mediums, I think you need to hit a little bit differently, um, whether it's yeah. text messaging, email, phone calls, a client portal, right? Like, and that's, you know, what, what technology has done now is allowed lawyers to remove, if you're using it properly, you remove attorney-client communication from the, like, from the issue column, Right. It can never really be an issue if you're using technology properly. And like, you know, client portals, like, like the one we just released in Lawmatics gives your clients that access to their matter and to things happening whenever they want. Right. And that's just, that's what they're looking for. Right. And there's just no reason not to provide it to them. Right. And it's, you know, it, it could be just being able to connect with the status of their case. I, I like what you're saying with using different mechanisms to, to communicate with them because they're asking different things a lot of times. If you just want to know the status of your case, Client Portal is a wonderful way to connect. If they have a question as to documents that they're filling out for you, well, maybe they need to email you. Maybe they need to do something like that. Or maybe they need to actually come in and schedule a, a meeting with you. But there's more than one mechanism for communicating with them. And I think you're right. Being kind of the master of all those ways of connecting with them is you said, you know, just communicating, just small, keeping them informed was table stakes at the beginning of this. But I think even that is almost that now, you know, yeah, it, I think it's you're almost absolutely imperative. I think you're right. I mean, I think table stakes have changed, right? As technology mm -hmm. has improved and now a client's going to expect that. And I think as, as the industry evolves over the next couple of years, I think you should, if, if things go how they should and lawyers are using technology the way that they should, then that number one complaint at state bars should become something other than attorney-client communication. There is just no good reason for that to be an issue anymore. You almost have to purposefully try to be bad at communication as a lawyer now. So there's just no, there's no good reason for it at all. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Well, Matt, I appreciate you talking with us again today. Uh, it's always good to have you in. And if people want to learn more about the new client portal that you guys have with Lawmatics, they can go to lawmatics.com and click on get a demo. And obviously they can get a demo. Yes. Thank you, Zach. Thanks again, Matt. Hi. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you to everybody who's listening. So you asked me to talk a little bit about how I got to this work on ethics. Like all of you, I'm a lawyer by training. I went to Columbia Law School and I started out life in a very big corporate law firm, Sullivan and Cromwell, which was great training. And in particular, I did a lot of international work. But pretty early on, including having done the ethics courses in law school and sort of the bar requirements for ethics, I realized that the law was falling far short of reality. Back in my day, reality was things like early stage derivative securities and then quickly it moved into the Silicon Valley technology world, and the law was kind of nowhere. And so I expanded my way of thinking about both problem solving and what it would actually take to figure out where the law should regulate, where it shouldn't regulate, and how organizations can behave well. And I started focusing on a much broader view of ethics. It's all outlined in my book, The Power of Ethics. We can dig into that um, however you'd like. Yes, Susan. I'm so excited for you to be here today because I think this is going to be a really interesting topic because as 
as I just shared with you before we hit record, lawyers talk about ethics a lot in terms of we all took a course and we all we all use these words, but what does it actually mean and how are we using that to make decisions in our life and in our business, which is I think the approach you take. And maybe there's, I know we can, we're going to dig into all this because there's this idea of black and white and we really live in a lot of gray. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So one of the themes of my work is that, as you've described, I'm sort of on the rampage to banish binary thinking. And binary thinking comes up in a lot of ways. It comes up in sort of our wanting to put things into categories of ethical and unethical or label things. And the world isn't really categorizable, if I can put it that way. Now, there are some things that really are binary. So racism, sexual misconduct, the kind of thing that I write about in the book, for example, that we saw at Boeing, where you know the CEO, the former CEO, was asking to keep planes flying, even though there were two deadly accidents that he couldn't explain. That kind of thing is binary. It's just absolutely not. But most of the things that we're looking at, it's a question of weighing risks and opportunities. So what I outline in the book and what I do in my own work is a lot of looking to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks and to try to look at that from the perspective of a number of different stakeholders. And this really helps lawyers in a number of ways. It helps lawyers in terms of how you all manage your own businesses, but it also helps you in terms of how you think about client work because no matter what kind of client work you're in, in most cases, we're talking about a world in which we have to navigate the gray. So for example, many bad things about social media, fake news, online bullying and harassment, et cetera. But many really important things, like sometimes the only way someone can get information about a vaccine or about a medical treatment, sometimes the only way someone can connect with a family member. So we want to be careful that we're not throwing out the benefits of everything that's happening in society today, because that in and of itself is as much of an ethics risk. And I think where the law fits into that is that as lawyers, we're all you know, looking to Washington and to our states to say, get moving, regulate some of this that has become binary, some of the completely unacceptable use of data or biased artificial intelligence or things like that. But on the other hand, don't over-regulate. We don't wanna be stepping on societally beneficial innovation. And we're smart enough as lawyers that we can navigate both and still enforce the law. And as you say, still respect our very formal and very limited code of ethics that we all studied for the bar exam. Right. One of the things you said in your book is that ethics are an early stage endeavor, not an eraser or a cleanup act after harm's done. And so I love this idea that like ethics should come first, not after. And really, we should think of it as a tool for the decision making process. And I know you outline even more specifically how that looks. But could you speak to that? And how do you start to move us to thinking about this as a tool we can use proactively when we're faced with decisions or situations? So one of the things that's really important is that, you know, of course, we all find ourselves and in particular lawyers, we find ourselves in positions where we do have to sort out problems that have happened. So to take an example that's in the news right now, at the extreme, the case of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, mm -hmm. where there was sort of rampant misconduct of all kinds, and that's being sorted out in the courts in different ways. But I'm arguing that we need to be integrating ethics into our decision making at the earliest possible stages, whether it's innovators thinking about, you know, do we really need this product or what will be the potential for negative consequences not just, oh, I've got this great new dating app. And so it happens at the level of innovation, but it also happens at the level of our ethics around relationships. If we're gonna enter into a partnership, if we're gonna enter into a joint venture or other kinds of business law or even family law that maybe some of the firms that you work with might engage in, thinking about at the time of the decision, what will be the consequences over time? So I'm asking people to look at the short, medium and long-term consequences, but at the time of the decision, as opposed to deciding something and then two weeks later coming back and saying, now I'm going to make another decision for the next two weeks and then the next two weeks, but really thinking upfront. And it's a strategic tool. I tell leaders all the time, and it can be a leader of a, of a huge corporation or a global NGO, or it can be a leader of a small firm, that the degree to which we integrate ethics into our decision-making 
is one of our best strategies. But if we fail to use that strategy, failure to integrate ethics into our decision-making becomes one of our greatest risks. And so how do you start to work through that framework and use it in this early decision-making process? So there are a couple of things. Um, I have a four-word framework and it's outlined in the book, but it literally is four words so that by the time you read the first chapter, it becomes part of how you think. It's not something that you have to, you know, memorize and belabor. And just quickly, the first element of it, I call principles. Some people might call it values. And that's basically deciding what are the sort of five or six or seven principles that you think are most important for you. So it might be for a small law firm. For some, it might be integrity or compassion. For others, it might be something like accountability or transparency. It's for everyone to decide. I don't dictate other people's principles, but the basic premise is that your principles define who you are. They tell the world how you're going to behave. And in fact, they also tell the world how you expect them to behave with you. Yes. Now, the gray comes in because very often we find our principles in conflict. You know, we want to have all kinds of freedom of expression, for example, but at the same time, we want respect. So that's certainly something that's coming out in a lot of uh, situations with, with questions around free speech. But there are many examples of principles coming into conflict. But the first step is to sort of think about what principles apply for you. And just one rule of thumb is that your principles, you should be able to look at them and say, if I come back in a year's time, I'll be able to know if by and large, I respected them. And to take an example of principles that are not principles, we can look at Uber, and we all know how Uber you know, imploded, um, particularly with ethical uh, failings. And er Uber's early stage principles were things like toe stomping, make magic. Very hard to argue that you can be held accountable for making magic. Right. So that's a that's a pretty um, good rule of thumb. If, you know, could you be held accountable? The second is information. And what I'll say about information is that, you know, we never have all the information we wish we could have when it comes to decision making. But what we want to think about, particularly in this complex, technologically written world, is what are the gaps between the information we wish we had and the information that we have? So, um, for example, to take it, and this is an example that won't necessarily directly affect a lot of the listeners, but gene editing. We really don't know the negative consequences of gene editing of embryos. It's such a high risk, and that information gap is so important that we should just say pause, not okay now, which by, the, by and large the scientific community has said. Sometimes we don't have information, and that's fine because the information isn't that important. I think the, the, the measure for information is, would the consequences be so severe if you were wrong that you should press pause? Right. You know, or are things irreversible? So for example, once you've posted a photo of a baby on Facebook, you have no idea where it's going to end up. So you had better be sure that you want that photo out there and that you're fine if it goes through a trail of being copied and Snapchatted and various other things to people you might not know. The third really important part of the framework uh, is stakeholders. And what I'll say about this in particular for small law firms is, you know, just think about the many stakeholders that you're taking into account in your decision making. All of your employees, your, your team is going to be affected by the ethics of how you might handle a particular client matter or by the principles that you select. So that's certainly one stakeholder group, but your clients are another stakeholder group. The legal system is another stakeholder group, your families. So think, think large about stakeholders. And then finally, consequences. And as I said, the sort of the key way of looking at consequences for me is to make sure that we're keeping multiple timeframes in our mind. We're looking at the short-term consequences, but also the medium and long-term consequences. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I love the framing and so specific in thinking through all the stakeholders, like I think it's easy when you're in the moment to think this is going to impact me or me and one particular client. But I have seen, I'm sure all of us have in practice that sometimes our decisions go well beyond what we expect. And we're like, no, this really did impact my, the whole team or my family or another family of the client, right? Like it just keeps going. And so it's hard in the moment to stop and take that step back. But I like that you're encouraging us to do it. 
Yeah, and I think it's particularly important when you're dealing with smaller firms that are so important in the in sort of the fabric of society. Small law firms are absolutely critical to upholding justice, absolutely critical to fighting for societally uh, beneficial principles like against racism, and very, very important also for individually and collectively setting the standards for the larger firms in many ways. And it's true that when we look at some of the bigger cases in the news, we can learn from them as well, even for smaller firms. I mean, if we look at some of the firms that are not actually that large that are handling huge cases, but like the opioid case, look at the stakeholders in the opioid case. All it takes is the family of one person who was you know, poorly subscribed opioids and suffered a tragic addiction. The entire family can be destroyed over this. In addition to the individual, businesses can be destroyed. And it goes on and on. And then every for every person that that happens, I talk about the contagion of unethical behavior. And we saw that certainly in the opioid case, but many of the cases that we see, even things like the way parents make decisions about how to distribute wealth to children or how we handle divorce or how we uh, advise small businesses, all of those kinds of things end up being contagious and affecting many other stakeholders, as you're saying. So I'm curious, I have a guess, but let me ask you, as the lawyer who's providing advice and counsel to our clients, how much do we have a duty to educate our clients on the ethics or outcomes of the decisions they're making? Because oftentimes, as you know, we're hearing our clients say, you know, fight, fight, fight. I want throw everything at them or, I, you know, this is the direction I want to w- make. And we're in a very unique role where we are that trusted advisor, where we have I think you would agree the obligation to sometimes stop and have our clients go through this process that we might need to actually walk them through because they're not going to be able to do it independently. So you make a really great point and it's a great question. We have legal obligations in our legal ethics, so to speak, about zealously representing clients and the like. And so they're very specific things. And without in any way undercutting those obligations, I think that in today's world, we have an obligation to say in many things that our clients are involved in, the ethics has to go above and beyond the law simply because the law is nowhere near catching up. And it might be in a corporate situation like something with technology, but let's all remember that technology also affects our day-to-day lives. So it can be anything from what happens if you put a journal on social media and someone passes away, who gets to control what happened to that journal that was posted, all the way to what happens if you're representing you know, a social media company on which it was posted. So I think we do have an ethical duty. We have to make choices ourselves. And we do have to say to our clients, you know, it's obviously we're representing our clients and it's their choice and they're, they're the ones making various decisions. But to say, are you going to be happy once you've thought through the short, medium, and long-term consequences of this? If you win all of this, is that going to serve you well? You know, even if the law gives you what you want, whether you're suing somebody or whether you're negotiating an agreement. And there are many um, sort of historically known precedents for this kind of thinking without labeling it as such. But for example, many negotiation experts will tell you that you never want one person to win everything. That's never a good outcome for a negotiation, even if you can kind of force things through. That never really sort of sets well. If there's a merger or acquisition and it's negotiated that way, there are longer term consequences to employee reaction, the public's reaction, shareholders' reactions, et cetera. So I think we certainly have nothing to lose by by having this broader discussion with clients. And the more that we are involved in areas where the law is falling short, in my view, the more of an obligation we have. Again, we we have to respect our legal ethics uh, obligations and we have to respect our clients' wishes by and large. But certainly broadening the conversation can be really important. Yeah. We have to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. But when we come back, I want to shift a little bit. I have, well, we'll see where we go. Support for today's episode comes from Text Expander. Minimize effort, maximize productivity with Text Expander. Text Expander helps you work faster and smarter so you can focus your time on your most important work. Drive faster results in three steps. One, create. Make snippets of text for support responses, sales outreach, or even common emails to save them in Text Expander. Two, trigger. 
Just type a few characters and watch the snippet automatically expand your text. You can add fill in the blank or more complex functionality to customize your message. Three, share. Share snippets across your organization. Your team can customize and insert the text in any app on Mac, Windows, Chrome, or iOS with a few keystrokes. Are you a startup looking to scale? Text Expander is here to help you on your journey. Check out Text Expander for Startups, a program that's specifically designed to help startup teams communicate more consistently, accurately, and efficiently. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Visit TextExpander.com forward slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. Support for today's episode comes from Rankings.io, helping hyper-competitive personal injury attorneys dominate first-page rankings through search engine optimization to become better recognized as the leading law firm in your metro. Rankings is solely focused on SEO for personal injury law firms. You'll work with an entire team of SEO specialists dedicated to helping clients dominate search results with unparalleled industry expertise. Rankings focuses on proof, not promises, by delivering results and never leaving their clients in the dark. You will receive monthly reports that give a full snapshot of where you stand as you watch your firm climb to the first page of Google and generate high-value leads. Most importantly, you'll be one of an elite few. Rankings' unrelenting conviction to be the best drives them to do everything to ensure the personal injury law firms working with them are dominating the search results. To see if you're a fit, visit rankings.io forward slash lawyerist to get started. Today's podcast is brought to you by Latera. Delivering high quality work on time and on budget is what matters most to your clients. Latera helps law firms maximize client retention rates, increase profit margins, and enhance lawyer happiness. In short, they simplify complex workflows by connecting legal teams to the data they need every day. The result? End user happiness. Most of the world's largest law firms, boutique firms, and corporate legal departments trust Latera to help their legal teams manage all of their documents, deals, cases, and data. Are you ready to join them? Latera is excited to hear about the challenges facing your organization, show you their software in action, or simply discuss whatever else might be top of mind. Get a demo with their document experts today by visiting latera.com forward slash lawyerist. So I'm back, Susan, and... Something that I read that you say a lot and I want to explore is this phrase of muck around in uncertainty. Right. And so, yeah, I want to know a little bit more, like, how do we actually muck around in uncertainty? Like, what does that look like? So uh, I teach, as you know, I teach um, several different classes at Stanford and they evolve over time. And the first day that I taught my ethics on the edge course goes back about eight years and on the very first day, at the very beginning of class, I said, I'm welcoming you all to muck around in uncertainty. And as you all might imagine, Stanford students, or indeed any university students that have you know, a goal of an A, don't <laughs> like uncertainty. They want to know the path to the grade, and they want to know exactly what it's going to take to get there. What I mean by that is that many of the ethical dilemmas we face, as we discussed earlier, don't have explicit right and wrong answers. And our job is to kind of step right into it and explore the risks and opportunities. And it's complicated. And it can also require us to kind of look in the mirror and say, just how much am I willing to put up with as a matter of risk? And it also very importantly um, requires us to put on someone else's shoes. So very often when we're in the situation of, you know, would I think, do I think driverless cars should be legal? Well, you know, it's really easy for me to say when I live in a country where there's great medical care, there's great roads by and large, you know, there's access to cars, there's access to other forms of transportation. If someone has had a few too many drinks or is not able to drive for physical reasons. But, you know, let's look at the developing countries. If we look at World Bank data, for example, a vast percentage of the world's deadly car accidents happen in developing economy countries. So for them, the risk reward calculation is very different. So I'm always asking people as we are looking at these questions where there isn't a particular right answer to think about, you know, think about that person who will be the one who experiences the worst consequences of your decision, whether that's an accident with a driverless car that wasn't ready to be on the road, or whether that's being condemned to more time in a very deadly set of circumstances of roads and lack of medical care and the like. And then imagine that that person is you. So that's one way we can get our bearings. But the other way is to go back to the framework. So when we think about the four words, principles, information, stakeholders, consequences, 
that really helps us get our bearings um, in these situations of uncertainty. And by the way, we can have uncertainty without high tech. We can have uncertainty about things like family questions. You know, do I owe it to give the same amount in my will to all of my children when one of my children might be a multimillionaire and one might actually be unable to work for some reason? Or ethical questions around friendships or, you know, should I read my child's diary? So these kinds of um, uncertainty can happen and we can use this framework in any kind of question that might arise. Yeah. Now you got me thinking, should I read my child's diary? (laughs) (laughs) But I think the main thing is to be realistic. I talk a lot about, you know, ethics happens in reality and we can create our own little more convenient world where things look clear, our own little subset of reality, all we want. But in fact, reality will always come back to bite. So I think it's best to just acknowledge that in many cases, we are in very uncertain territory and and, and do our best to navigate it. And the framework uh, is designed to help that. What's really coming up for me is my husband and I find ourselves a lot in the evenings. I mean, there's so many issues in today's world, as you know, Mm -hmm. that drive these kind of conversations. And we find ourselves in really interesting discussions. And sometimes my 10 year old will pop up and be like, you guys are arguing. Why are you fighting? And we're like, no, we're discussing it. And, you know, we're trying to model for her that you don't just go with the first thing, you know, you have to think about it. And sometimes we'll present opposing views or have you thought about it this way? And what if I change this fact or scenario, which is what I hear you saying. And but we have to practice that muscle. It doesn't always come. Absolutely. And and so two things I'd like to say in response to your really interesting comment. One is the book that I'm working on now that will be out on April 5th is called The Little Book of Big Ethical Questions. And what it is, is 75 questions from, it's everything from, do you read your child's uh, diary to Spotify? And should we use free Spotify? It cuts across health and technology and family and work. And what it is, is question on one side, And then my exploration that is designed to help trigger conversation, uh, give a little bit of background so people have more fun, so you don't have to go looking things up on your own, but also in no way to tell you that the answer is X, but rather to help everybody think about the best answer for each of you. So look for the little book of big ethical questions. I will. And it's really meant to be almost like a, a parlor game kind of thing, as you're saying. But something very important in what you just said underlies the premise of this book, which is that we need to be able to check our own assumptions. Assumptions are very dangerous in ethics. Any kind of uh, gut reaction or it was that way last year, so it must be that way this year, it closes our mind. And what you're saying is these conversations that you're having are also modeling for your 10-year-old to keep an open mind and to listen, and to not come at these difficult questions with our own assumptions. And I think that's a really, really important part of ethics. But certainly, as you're saying, modeling that, you know, these things don't have right answers. Different views matter. And all of my work, including the power of ethics and the work I do at Stanford and with clients, is all about democratizing ethics. It's all about making it accessible for everyone so that you don't have to be the chief ethics officer of Google in order to be able to have a voice into in society's ethics today. Yeah. And I think you're touching on one of the last points I wanted to get to in the time we have today, which is, is the idea that you talk about information being accessible, that we have this obligation to make things more accessible. And I wonder if you could speak to that. Sure. So information is the second rung of my framework. And I mentioned that, you know, we need to be mindful of gaps. One of the reasons we have gaps in information is that the providers of information don't give it to us in a clear, digestible way. And so when we talk about things like transparency, I'm constantly telling companies and even lawyers, transparency means that the recipient of the information understands it. That might mean the patient in a hospital who's receiving a consent form. That might mean the person who's going on 23andMe website and about to buy that kit. But we need to have People, companies, et cetera, have an obligation to provide us information in a way that we understand it. And by understand it, I mean, we understand the consequences for us. So in other words, we understand that if we use 23andMe, we might learn things that we cannot unknow. 
Right. And what we need is to have that information provided to us in a way that is flashing red lights, not you dig through 20 pages of a website and you find it in faded gray microprint at the bottom if you happen to be willing to read that far. And a really good example of this is social media terms of service. You know, after all my years drafting underwriting agreements for large investment banks that were 175 pages, even I don't fully understand the terms of service of things of social media companies or the terms of service of a company like Robinhood, where so many just normal people were investing. And, you know, that Robinhood is that that online platform for individual investors, incomprehensible terms of service. So uh, I think we have a societal obligation to just change the way we deliver information to normal people. Yes. We've talked about that on, on this show and in our community before. Something as simple as a lawyer's engagement letter. So not even going as complicated as social media terms and conditions, but what you're providing to your client. Is it 20 pages of, like you said, really, I mean, or is it just clearly written simple and what they need to know to understand what it's going to be like to work with you. I love that point. And I have to say, I've been myself the recipient of lawyers engagement letters, or a most recently, in fact, yesterday, an accounting firm. And, you know, and I look at it, and I have the same impression that I have with social media, which is that it's designed, excuse the phrase, but it's designed for them to sort of cover their bums, yes, liability wise. And it's not designed to help me understand what I'm signing on for. And to your really excellent point, what I need to know is what are they going to deliver? What is it going to cost? Do they have any conflicts? And what are they not going to deliver that I, as an ordinary non-expert, might expect to get? And they should warn me that it, that's not part of the package. And as you say, that should take a page or two, not 20. Yeah, we've even we've even experimented, like, should it be in cartoons? Like, what's your reader level, right? Like, I mean- Absolutely, and, and, and joking aside, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. We live in a text message society and we live in a society where people should be able to get services, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, you know, a plumber, and understand what it is that they're getting um, without having to, you know, spend half a day trying to figure it out. Yeah, for sure. So many things we can dive into. I'm super excited that we had this conversation because I think it will open a lot of people's eyes to how they should start thinking about ethical decisions and information in their everyday life. And maybe we can have you come back when that book's out because I know I, I want to dive in and that sounds like great discussion. No, I'd love to. Yeah, it's meant to be sort of, you know, as I said, fun. And also it's set up so that you can choose the topics of interest to you and go. you don't have to read it in any particular order you know, almost like dinner party conversation starter. I love it. We have that. We have a set of cards that we got for our table and it asks little questions for the family. So it sounds like this is the book version of that. So we're, we'll be all in. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for having me. And thank you to everybody who's listened. Thank you. The Lawyerist podcast is produced by Bailey Tiller and edited by Ryan Croft. Are you ready to implement the ideas we discussed here into your practice? Wondering what to do next? Here are your first two steps. First, if you haven't read The Small Firm Roadmap yet, grab the first chapter for free at lawyerist.com slash book. Looking for help beyond the book? Let's chat about whether our coaching communities are right for you. Head to lawyerist.com slash community slash lab to schedule a 15-minute call with our community manager. The views expressed by the participants are their own and not endorsed by the Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. 